I am Roberta Felicki Paneski, and I am a board member of the Wisconsin Academy Sciences, Arts, and Letters, plural, 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 which I was reminded of when I joined the board. So we work at the intersections of all of those things. And one of my favorite stories came from a board member who was renowned in science. And he said, when I had a classroom full of science folks, I said, at the end of this course, you will write me a poem about what you have learned. That's what the intersection means. They had to think very differently, use the other part of their brain. And that's what the Wisconsin Academy for years and years has done. So I would encourage you if you are Again, this is the advertisement. If you are not a member of the Wisconsin Academy, please consider being one. And we do wonderful things. My next is, I am introducing our executive director who keeps us all going, Jane. It's yours. Thanks, Bert. So I'm Jane Elder, and I'm the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences, Arts, and Letters. And we're so excited to be here tonight with our members and friends in Sheboygan, and so glad that Val is here with us tonight for our Academy talk, What's Going On in the Great Lakes? As Bert mentioned, the Wisconsin Academy promotes the understanding of science and the appreciation of visual and literary arts in Wisconsin. And the work that we do and the events that we host, like tonight's, are all designed to bring people together at the intersection of the science and arts and letters to inspire discovery, illuminate creative work, and foster civil dialogue on important issues. We don't do this work alone, and I want to thank those who made this evening possible. Our Wisconsin Academy members and donors who support our work, our host, the Mead Public Library, Academy Board Member Roberta Felicki Paneski, and a special thank you to our partner, the, the Mead Public Library Foundation. I'm delighted that many of the Foundation's board members are here to, and able to join us this evening. And would you stand for a moment so we can acknowledge you? Uh, tonight, uh, tonight's talk marks this fall's uh, first fall talk in our partnership with the Library Foundation, and we appreciate their commitment to the library and to this community by helping to make this evening and others like it possible. Let's thank all of our sponsors, please, for this evening. If you're interested in learning more about the Academy, our programs, or ways to get involved, please find me, Bethany, or Amanda after the talk. And you're also invited to take home a complimentary copy of our quarterly magazine, Wisconsin People and Ideas, which has been out at the registration table. Now, this is my moment before I introduce our speaker to ask everyone to please take that moment to turn off your electronic devices. <laughs> Thanks for doing so. Tonight, I'm, I'm very happy to present Val Klump, Professor and Dean of Research and Senior Director of the School of Freshwater Sciences at the University of Mil Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Val's research focuses on how nutrients and carbon are cycled in the lakes. And this work has taken him from the deepest soundings in Lake Superior in Michigan, aboard a research submersible, to the largest and oldest lake in the world, Lake Baikal in Siberia. His recent research highlights the presence and dynamics of dead zones, such as the one in Green Bay, including the impact climate change has on their extent and duration. I've had the opportunity to work with Val as a participant in the Academy's Waters of Wisconsin Network, and also in my capacity as a member of the International Joint Commission's Great Lakes Water Quality Board. Yes, he's a distinguished scientist, but he's also a committed public servant helping public decision makers and concerned citizens better understand the complex and remarkable Great Lakes ecosystem as we strive to keep it healthy and resilient. 
I think we're in for a great evening, so please help me welcome our speaker, Dr. Val Kump. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Jane, and uh, thank you for coming out this evening. Um, uh, I'm going to do uh, have a presentation that hopefully lasts about 30, 40 minutes, and then I'll open it up to questions. So if you have questions, uh, hang on to them maybe to, towards the end. If it's really pressing, raise your hand and we'll interrupt and I'll answer right away. <clears throat> so the, the topic this evening is, ab is about the Great Lakes. Uh, probably most of you know that the Great Lakes represent 20% of the world's surface freshwater. Um, this is without question the greatest single freshwater resource on the face of this planet. We are extremely lucky uh, and privileged to live here. So, oh, I need to talk to Is that better? How's this one? That's better? Okay. That one's better? Sometimes those wireless ones are a little weak. Okay. If you, uh, <coughs> well, quick on the trigger here. Okay. If you, uh, uh, took the Great Lakes and spread them out across the entire 48 states. It would cover the entire 48 states to a depth of nine and a half feet. Gives you an idea how much water is in the Great Lakes. It would cover both North and South America to a depth of one foot. <clears throat> uh, it uh, supports a, a $4 billion a year uh, recreational sports fishery. Uh, it supplies drinking water for some almost 40 million people in the basin. Uh, and it's the th as a, as a region, it's the third, it will be the third largest economy in the world. Uh, the system uh, really uh, cannot be put a price on it. This is a priceless environment. We call them lakes, but that's really a misnomer. These are not lakes. These are inland seas. Some of the biggest ships ever been built have been sunk uh, in the Great Lakes, as you know. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and a, a fully developed sea, for example, in Lake Michigan, that is when the wind blows the hardest, the longest distance, over the greatest fetch is that will produce a, a, a waves of up to 25 feet. So think about that. Um, it's bad enough to be out there in six feet. You can ask my friend John uh, <coughs> Kennedy there, who's a seagoing fellow in the Great Lakes, and some of you else, but, uh, that 25 is just really hard to believe. <coughs> okay. Yet despite their size, these are surprisingly uh, fragile systems. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. One is, evolutionarily speaking, these are relatively young systems. They're about 10,000 years old. The food chains in the Great Lakes are relatively simple, which means that they have niches which are open to invasive species. And that's been one of the things uh, has been uh, a big issue in the Great Lakes, and I'll talk more about that later. They're also connected to the rest of the world. We're two ports to call away from essentially the entire rest of the world uh, through international shipping, and this has been one of the major uh, vectors by which um, invasive species come, have gotten into the system. University of Michigan did a study uh, a couple of years ago looking at various stressors. They looked at 34 stresses on the Great Lakes, and they developed up this map where red, and they overlaid those stresses. Uh, and red is areas of high stress, uh, blue is areas of low stress. And you can see, um, my pointer working, there we go. <coughs> you can see that uh, uh, near shore environments, near shore areas are more highly stressed. And if you go downstream in the lakes, you see higher stress, which makes some sense. You can see these lines in Lake Superior, you want to guess what that might be? Those are the shipping lanes, right, in the Great Lakes. So I'm not going to talk about all 34, but I'm going to highlight a few. <laughs> Some, <laughs> yeah, all right, good. We don't want to be here that long. Of course, uh, I guess many of you in this room probably remember this event, 1969, the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, Ohio caught on fire. And it wasn't the first time the Cuyahoga River caught on fire, caught on fire several times. And it wasn't the only river in the Great Lakes that caught on fire for that matter. The River Rouge in, in Detroit also caught on fire. <clears throat> this, of course, uh, picture made to cover of Time magazine, and this event was largely credited in part with the passage of the, uh, um, the impetus for the passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972. Um, at that time, Lake Erie was declared dead. Um, uh, the water uh, rivers uh, were, were foul. You couldn't drink them. You couldn't fish them. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> As a result of the passage of the Clean Water Act, however, we invested a tremendous amount in, in, pollu in pollution abatement and sewage treatment in particular. Billions of dollars was invested. 
In Lake Erie, the target was to reduce phosphorus loading um, to the system by about 60 percent. This is the passage of the Clean Water Act, and by the mid-1980s, they basically hit the target load for phosphorus. And Lake Erie recovered. The uh, water quality improved dramatically, and this is what I call, caused what I call the Seuss effect. Now, many of you probably, if you had kids, if you had grandchildren, you've, I'm sure you've read this book, The Lorax, Dr. Seuss, and there's a line in this that says, uh, you're talking about water pollution, They'll walk on their fins and get woefully weary in search of some water that isn't so schmeary. I hear things are just as bad up in Lake Erie. <laughs> well, the people in Lake Erie say, hey, Dr. Seuss, you know, Lake Erie has gotten better. You know, you should remove this. They wrote him a letter, say, hey, take that line out. And so, in fact, uh, he did. If you go to the library, I'm sure if you go to this library, you go check out the lower actually will no longer find. I hear things are just as bad up in Lake Erie. But of course, things have changed. And Lake Erie is schmeary again. <clears throat> this is a satellite photograph of an algal bloom in Lake Erie in 2011, and this has recurred since then as well. Anytime you can see an algal bloom from outer space, you probably know you have a problem. Um, this is a result of nutrient runoff from the land, primarily. Um, and it consists largely of a single organism called microcystis, a cyanobacteria, or what they call blue-green algae. It's not really an algae, it's a bacteria. And this particular species, microcystis, produces an algal toxin, microcystin, which is one of the most toxic substances known. <clears throat> and uh, the World Health Organization limit for drinking water is about one part per billion. Um, during this particular algal bloom, concentrations in Lake Erie were measured up to 1,200. Well, the standard is one. Contact for swimming is 20. And of course, you probably also remember, and you can see a boat here going through this algal bloom. Uh, I'm told that it actually slowed the engines down. It was so thick. Uh, <coughs> you also probably remember uh, three years ago in August, um, the Toledo water intake was shut down because of high concentrations of that to algal toxin in, the, in their drinking water system. Folks were told you cannot you don't drink it, don't wash your hands with it, don't give it to your pets, you can't boil it. The hospital couldn't use it to sterilize their instruments. The zoo had to get alternative sources of drinking water for the animals. Of course, bottled water disappeared off the shelves just like that. <clears throat> it was truly a Cuyahoga moment. It shut down the water intake to some four or 500,000 people um, overnight, essentially. And that's one of the problems we face uh, throughout the Great Lakes is nutrient runoff. That's true here in Wisconsin as well. Um, if you look at Green Bay, uh, you get these large algal blooms. And one of the things that one of the consequences of those algal blooms is when that material dies, sinks to the bottom, and begins to decay, well, that decay process consumes oxygen. And that's the formation of the low dissolved oxygen in the bottom water and the production of what they call dead zones. You probably heard about the dead zone in, in the Gulf of Mexico, a dead zone in Lake Erie. There's a dead zone in Green Bay. There are probably some four or 500 dead zones around the world. They're all about the, pretty much the same issue is, is driving them, and that is excess nutrient runoff uh, from the landscape. The lakes are simply a reflection of what we do uh, on the land. <clears throat> However, uh, there's, uh, as a result of the work that's been done, and I have to give a shout out to John Kennedy here, who's an old friend of mine, who was one of the, one of the initial um, fathers, I guess, of the monitoring program in Green Bay uh, by the, the Green Bay Metropolitan Sewage District. We've been tracking oxygen in the bottom water since, what, 1986, right, John? Um, a remarkable set of data. Um, and primarily because of that data and, and the research that that data has triggered, uh, there's a much greater awareness now of this problem in Green Bay. And I'm glad to say that the community in this area is like understanding now this is an issue. And I think everybody is, is uh, um, taking it to heart and understand that we, we need to do something about that. So I'm very encouraged by uh, <clears throat> by that activity. It's not going to be easy. The target, we think, 
In order to improve water quality to an acceptable level is to reduction in nutrient inputs on the order of 40 to 50 percent. That's not going to be easy. That's going to be difficult. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take years, if not decades. But I think people now understand the nature of the problem and they're, and they're beginning to look at solutions to solve that. <clears throat> There are other sort of more non-conventional pollution threats, of course, uh, and I'll mention a couple here. Uh, the first is spills. I'm sure maybe you've seen this. There was a, a set of articles by Dan Egan recently in the Milwaukee Journal talking about the transportation of petroleum products throughout the Great Lakes, primarily in pipelines, but in other things. <clears throat> and there are a whole bunch of pipelines that crisscross the Great Lakes, but one in particular uh, interest is the, is the pipelines that cross the Straits of Mackinac. There are two pipelines here called uh, Line 5. Um, they transport about 20 million gallons of crude oil, natural gas, every day. Uh, they are over 60 years old. The company that operates them, Enbridge, wanted to increase the flow through those pipes. Uh, the only way you can increase the flow through a fixed diameter is to increase the pressure in that pipe. And if you had a 60-year-old pipe, people became concerned. Um, <clears throat> Here's a, an animation of what would happen if there were a spill in a lake. The different colors represent uh, oil which would be released at different depths in t into the lake. This, uh, the Straits of Mackinac is without question the most dynamic region in the entire Great Lakes because the water flows in both directions back and forth because winds really push it. And the currents through here can be pretty dramatic. So you can see a clock running down here. This is six or seven days now. And you can see how far the oil has actually spread during that time period. Now, of course, we've dealt with oil spills before. You're familiar with the New Horizon oil spill in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. But of course, um, many of the dispersants they used in the Gulf of Mexico you could not use in the Great Lakes because we drink this water. This is also a much colder environment. Uh, the nature of this petroleum is different as well. It's much heavier crude. Um, <clears throat> my feeling is there would be, uh, there would be no uh, recovery from something like this. Uh, this is just another map uh, produced by Dave Schwab, which shows the sort of probability of where the oil might go after a spill uh, in the Strait. So it'd be, it'd be very widespread. Uh, so what's the risk? Well, also several years ago, uh, seven years ago now, there was a pipeline break on the Kalamazoo River, same company actually that operates the, the, the Straits of Mackinac also operates this particular pipeline. Um, it broke uh, and spilled about a million gallons of, of tar sand oil. Um, <clears throat> I think that happened on a Saturday. On a Sunday night, I got a call from Lon Couillard, who was the operator at the time of the Milwaukee water intake. He said, Val, do I have to worry about this? Because obviously the, the Kalamazoo River runs into Lake Michigan, and we draw our drinking water to Lake Michigan. I said, well, I don't think so because the EPA thinks they got it contained. It's not going to actually get all the way to Lake Michigan, and in fact, it didn't. Um, they're still working on that cleanup. They spent about a billion dollars to clean it up. Um, <clears throat> and so although the probability of a break may be low, the risk actually to the system, I think, is, is astronomical, and I think unacceptable, frankly. What about other things are we sort of on the, on the lookout for? Um, I'm sure you've also heard about this, uh, um, a whole a class of uh, contaminants known as emerging contaminants, things like pharmaceuticals, personal care products, uh, plasticizers, nanomaterials, flame retardants, a whole group of things. Uh, one of our scientists, uh, Rebecca Clapper, is one of the leading scientists in this area and is studying in particular pharmaceuticals in the lake. Here's a list of just a handful of the things that they have measured now. Uh, caffeine, we obviously know acetaminophen, some of these naproxen, I, you know, I use that. Um, a lot of these antimicrobial things they use for soaps, for example. Um, some antibiotics. This is, uh, here is the uh, calculation of the discharge from the South Shore uh, sewage treatment plant in Milwaukee. That's just one of the two treatment plants in Milwaukee. Their estimate, uh, one, of the, one of the most common drugs they find is metformin, which is a type 2 diabetes drug, very heavily prescribed. Um, uh, <coughs> and uh, their estimate is 
This would be about 12,000 pounds of metformin are discharged to Lake Michigan every year. Now that's a heck of a lot of pills when you think about it. Um, they, uh, um, uh, she had a student, uh, um, Dan Blair, who was, uh, gave his, pre presented his dissertation uh, and included in that were some of the data and he was showing his data on metformin out in Lake Michigan. And uh, so finally I raised my hand and said, Ben, and I said, uh, you know, what's the lowest concentration you measured? Thinking that he would say, well, you know, when we got five miles offshore, we couldn't detect anything. But in fact, he didn't say, so well, the, the lowest we ever found was about 10 parts per billion um, at the furthest offshore station. In other words, they could find, no place that they looked in the lake did they not find this drug. Which means two things. One, there's a supply coming in and it appears to be building up and it doesn't, it doesn't go away. This drug does not decompose. And that's true of many of these pharmaceuticals. The same thing that makes them effective as medicines means they're not metabolized in the body. also means they translate through conventional sewage treatment plants largely unchanged. And so, um, <clears throat> the, they, now it's a testament to our analytical ability that we can actually measure these things because they're very trace concentrations. On the other hand, the entire medicine chest is out there. Uh, and there is evidence that they are affecting uh, microorganisms. I have another colleague um, of mine, Jim Waples, is looking at another pharmaceutical who happens to be radioactive. It's iodine-131. It's used in, in various treatments <coughs> and diagnostic procedures. What's interesting about this pharmaceutical, since it's radioactive, it has a, it has a, a half-life, which is only eight days, which means every eight days, half of it goes away. So obviously, if you turned off the tap in a very short period of time, you wouldn't see anything because it would all decay away. But the fact you can go out in the near shore of Lake Michigan and almost continuously measure the presence of this radioactive pharmaceutical means that it's constantly being supplied to the system. The fact is you can use that number to calculate the flux into the system. Another uh, thing of interest, I should mention too, for example, with respect to, to the metformin, uh, there's evidence that this has, uh, even at low levels, levels that we can measure in the environment, has estrogenic uh, or, or endocrine disruptor impacts. Um, you can find male fish that actually um, produce eggs in their gonads. So, and that's the first time that that had ever been um, detected or known I I for this particular drug. Uh, she got some pushback, actually, from the pharmaceutical industry on that. They didn't want to believe it, but <coughs> it's true. Uh, another uh, area of concern is microplastics. Um, a lot of the things we use, uh, some of the soaps, some of um, things like uh, suntan lotions, et cetera, have these uh, very small particles in it. Um, and so there's uh, evidence that microplastics are, are showing up uh, in the Great Lakes as, as well as the oceans. I put this number up here, 2050, to remind me to say that um, there was an estimate that by 2050, at the current rate, that the, the biomass of plastics in the ocean will equal the biomass of fish in the ocean. Now that's really hard to believe. Even if it's 10%, it's still an amazing number. <clears throat> and, th and the reason for that is that they just don't go away. You know, they, they uh, in fact, is later, uh, later this semester we have a, uh, world-renowned scientist from Hawaii who's been studying this is going to give some presentation on that. One of the things that um, if you look at sort of the toxicological effects of these organisms, of these compounds, in the old days you used to take a, an organism, you put it in a beaker, you'd squirt something in it until half of them died. It was known as an LC50. And, and nobody really understood that the mechanism of what impacted the organism. But today, because of DNA sequencing technology, we finally have the smoking gun, if you will, to understand how these compounds are interacting in the environment. One of the work, some of the work that Rebecca has done, for example, is looking at the impact of Prozac, which I'm sure you're familiar with, on fish. Um, <coughs> she's dosed. Uh, uh, small fish, fat had minnows. They have a very elaborate breeding behavior. The, the, the female will lay her eggs underneath a rock, the male will fertilize those eggs, and then he will guard that nest until they hatch out. Um, at very low concentrations of Prozac, concentrations that we can measure in the environment, the male sort of, uh, the female doesn't seem to care, she just broadcasts her eggs on the bottom of the tank, the male goes, I don't care, 
you know. He doesn't bother and basically, you know, reproduction fails. Actually, if you read the warning label for humans, the same problem, you know, <laughs> if you take pro Prozac. <laughs> but what's interesting is now she can take those fish, a fish that has not been exposed and a fish that has been exposed, and run their, their genome, their gene sequence, and look at which genes are what they call upregulated or downregulated, either turned on or turned off and compare that with an organism that has not been exposed and begin to understand the biological mechanism which is really causing this change in behavior. So it's really going to be the Rosetta Stone for understanding how these things impact the environment. Eventually, we'll be able to go out in the environment, grab a fish, bring it back, laboratory sequence their genome, and it'll tell us how it's being stressed. Now, we're a long way from there, but this technology has amazing uh, potential for trying to understand what's going on in the environment <clears throat> in a number of ways. <clears throat> if you were to ask me what's the sort of biggest impact uh, on the ecosystem today, it, I think without question it's been the, invas the invasion of non-native species. Um, I'm sure some of you are very familiar with the sea lamprey, which essentially decimated or wiped out the lake trout population in Lake Michigan. The alewife, which came in through the St. Lawrence Seaway, spiny water flea, round goby, and of course, these drysinid mussels. This, is a, this video was taken actually quite a few years ago um, in Lake Michigan by a good friend of mine, John Jansen. These are all zebra mussels, as it turns out, at this point. And two things to point out about that. One is how clear the water is. I mean, it looks like the Bahamas, right? And the other is uh, those rocks, as you can see, are totally covered. I mean, all of these, and these were not covered with zebra mussels before. So this is an indication of a niche that was totally open in the Great Lakes. Uh, an invasive species came in and just took over. Well, as it turns out, um, that was in the early 1990s. In the early 2000s, another drysinid mussel, a quagga mussel, which at arm's length looks just like a zebra mussel, but it has some differences. One, it can live on soft bottoms and soft substrates, whereas zebra mussels need something hard to attach to. And it can live in colder and deeper water. And as a result, quagga mussels have spread starting in the early 2000s, basically throughout Lake Michigan. In fact, as you can almost walk across the carpet of quagga mussels now in Lake Michigan, you are hard pressed to find a zebra mussel. Quagga mussels have essentially taken over the system and they did it very fast, in about four years. <clears throat> one of the consequences was that one of the bases of the, the, the food chain in the system, a little uh, crustacean, a shrimp-like fellow called Dipariah, um, which was a bottom dwelling, he had basically disappeared from the lake. So the fish that fed on it, like the bloater chub, the smoke fish you're all familiar with. Um, attention, please. The library will close in 30 minutes. OK. <laughs> All right. Check out and other computer services. Please check out all materials prior to 8 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> you, you don't ever want to cross the librarian, that's for sure. Okay. So, as a result, though, that, I mean, it basically, um, there was nothing for fish to eat, and the food chain largely collapsed in, in Lake Michigan. Now, there's been some indications that salmon are doing better again in Lake Michigan, but yellow perch, Whitefish, other native fish have been, have been essentially eliminated from the system. This is a, a trawl, a bottom trawl taken by a friend of mine, Harvey Bootsma. Um, this was taken several years ago, but things haven't changed. Uh, and they, you know, they're trawling for fish, and what they got was a big bag full of mussels. They did catch one fish. It was a round goby, which is also a non-native species. Um, and I have a video. We'll see if it'll play. <coughs> And this is, they put a camera on the bottom trawl, and this is what it looks like. And this is what it looks like, and it keeps looking like this for a long time, as long as they trawl this net. So basically, um, quagga mussels have taken over the Lake Michigan ecosystem. It is now estimated that there are four times more biomass in quagga mussels than there are in forage fish in the lake. Um, lake Superior, which is one of the most pristine lakes in the world, is now the third clearest lake in the Great Lakes. Both Lake Huron, the offshore waters of Lake Michigan, and Lake Huron are both clearer 
than in Lake Superior, and it's because of these mussels. They're voracious filter feeders, so they basically have filtered all the particulates of food particles out of the water column. Um, it was estimated when they invaded Lake Erie that they filtered an amount of water equivalent to the entire volume of the lake every six days. Now, Lake Erie is a big lake. <clears throat> it's caused uh, that water clarity means there's nothing in it, which means there's no food. It means that uh, there was about over an 80% decline in, in the phytoplankton, that is the algae that live in the water, and about a 70% decline in, in the pelagic um, primary production that feeds the fish in this system. So Lake Michigan and Lake Huron have been totally re-engineered from a system which had a pelagic food web or a water-based, water column-based food web to one that's now totally based on the sediment the organisms that live on the bottom. <clears throat> Well, there are also some, uh, some other impacts as a result of these mussels. One of the things is they immediately, of course, as I said, it looked like the, like the Caribbean, right? Um, they immediately cleared the, the water in the near shore. Uh, prior to zebra mussels, this is sort of, and quagga mussels, this is sort of what it looked like in the near shore. You only had, I mean, the near shore of Lake Michigan is fairly turbid, and so light only penetrated a little distance. Um, but then after these, um, um, the, these dry sand and mussels moved inshore, they cleared the water, and so now light could penetrate much deeper. And because they were filter feeders, they were bringing nutrients and, and supplied to the bottom. And they also provided something attached to it. This resulted in, a, in um, um, the blossoming of massive beds of Clodophora, which is an attached algae, which lives in the near shore of the Red. In fact, is Clodophora was the poster child for phosphorus removal back in the 70s and 80s. <coughs> What, uh, so now, if you go out in Lake Michigan and uh, look at the bottom in the near shore, this is what it looks like. It's just vast meadows of Clydophora. Now, there are mussels there. You can't see them. They're underneath the Clydophora. But they're there, and they're alive. Um, <clears throat> one of the sort of, um, of course, when this material dies, senescence breaks off in wave energy. It'll wash up on the beach. It begins to decay. It smells like, you know, all get out. Uh, everybody in Milwaukee, of course, blamed the Metropolitan Sewage District. Must be their fault. It smells like sewage. Got to be sewage, not sewage. Um, and the fact is, this problem was occurring throughout the Great Lakes in some of the most pristine areas. Door County, uh, Sleeping Bear, uh, National Seashore. Uh, and one of the consequences of this, too, is that when this stuff begins to decompose, it goes anaerobic, there's no oxygen in it, um, and it turns out it becomes the perfect media for the organism, which um, causes avian botulism, and so there's been a huge resurgence in avian botulism in the Great Lakes, is when these um, waterfowl feed in, in these, and pick out the little bugs and crustaceans that are in this, and they take up that toxin, um, and <clears throat> so that's become a major problem, and one of our scientists, Harvey Bootsma, is actually working in Sleeping Bear Sand Dunes, a uh, national seashore, uh, studying the, the, the mechanisms behind this issue. Well, so most of these uh, invasive species uh, have come in uh, in ballast water. One of the, uh, there was a study done almost 10 years ago now, uh, maybe more than 10 years ago, um, by a couple of economists out of Grand Valley State, funded by the Joyce Foundation, it looked at the value of the international shipping in the Great Lakes. Now, shipping, maritime shipping in the Great Lakes is a multi-billion dollar a year industry. I mean, it's extremely valuable. But the vast majority of that is interlake, intra-lake transfer. It's like iron ore from Duluth to Gary, it's salt from Detroit or Cleveland to Milwaukee, or coal from uh, Ashtabula to where it needs to go. <clears throat> They estimated that the international shipping, that is, it requires, it comes out of the ocean through the St. Lawrence Seaway, was about $55 million a year. That was the value of that. That caught the attention of a lot of people because invasive species have been a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar impact on the system. $55 million, they said, wow, that's not much at all. And so there is a big move uh, afoot to try to physically separate the Great Lakes and say, hey, wait a minute, maybe we should maybe we should just close the seaway down. There are other ways to transport goods in and out. Uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway is too small now to carry these big container ships anyway. Um, so that's an ongoing, an ongoing debate. <coughs> well, what about uh, climate change? 
Uh, this was a, a, a chart taken out of, from NASA, the New York Times. Hottest year on record, 2015. And I put this slide together to go last year. And so, no, last year, no, 2016 was now the highest record. Um, 2017 was also a very hot year. Uh, at midway through the year, it was going to be, 17 was racked up to be the second hottest year on record. And I've been giving presentations about this issue for probably almost 20 years. I've said the same thing every year. The 10 hottest years have been in the la all been in the last 15 years. I've said that every year for 20 years. <clears throat> What's the impact? In Wisconsin, pretty dramatic. Um, these are projections from uh, the uh, Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, and uh, particularly the group in the Center for Climatic Research in, at UW-Madison. Um, it's good friends of mine, Dave Lorenz, uh, Dan Weimann, and others. Um, one of the projections for uh, the end of the century uh, is um, four to, to nine degrees Fahrenheit hotter, but nearly two weeks, uh, this is for Madison now, over 100 degrees. Now, I've lived in Milwaukee and Wisconsin for, I don't know, 36, 37 years now, and I can only remember, I don't remember a single day in Milwaukee where it was over 100. Um, to think that we would get two weeks over 100 and nearly two months overnight, these are daytime high temperatures. It's also projected to be wetter, a 10 to 20 percent increase in precipitation. Um, <clears throat> and that precipitation comes in more intense and more frequent events. Here is, oops, this will run. This is an animation, um, that's okay, it's not going to run. This is comparing 2012. This is for, very blurry, uh, looks like August. Um, these are the same date, 1992, which is a pretty normal year, climatically at least in the old days, and 2012, which at the time was one of the hottest years on record, has been superseded by several years since then. Um, and you can see how much warmer uh, temperature, it goes up, purple is warm, blue is cold, uh, and you can see how much warmer Lake Superior is, how much warmer Lake Michigan is in the summertime. We've started to see now um, Lake Michigan temperatures in the, in, in the middle of the lake hitting 80 degrees, more than once. That's pretty unusual for Lake Michigan. That's very unusual. One well, of the consequences of that is that uh, ice cover on the lakes is decreasing. Um, <clears throat> uh, this happens to be data for uh, Green Bay. Um, and one of the other consequences of that, particularly in Lake Superior, is that water temperatures are rising twice as fast as air temperatures. Now, the reason for that is because ice acts as a very good solar insulator. So during when the lake is covered with ice, sunlight sort of bounces off and it does not heat the lake. So the lake only starts to heat up really until the ice cover goes off. And as that open water period gets longer and longer, the period during which the, the lake can absorb solar radiation um, gets longer and longer, and so the temperature goes up faster and faster. Now, eventually you will reach a point at which you don't have any ice cover, and that process you know, reaches a new steady state. But um, the consequence is that over the last, say, 30 years, water temperatures are rising faster than air temperatures. <coughs> Well, what about lake levels? Uh, because climate is the primary controller of lake levels. Two things uh, basically control lake levels. The amount of precipitation, I get some rain and snowfall, and the amount of evaporation that occurs. Now there are you know, diversions in and out of the lakes. Um, and the fact is there are more diversions into the lakes than there are out of the lakes. Not many people knew that. But their impact on the lakes is very small relative to the two major things, how much rainfall we get, and how much evaporation occurs. As our climate gets wetter, we get more rainfall, lakes go up. As the temperature gets warmer, and particularly this time of year when you start to get cool air over warm water, you see that, that you know, steam coming off the lakes or fog. There's a lot of water going into the atmosphere. As the lakes get warmer, evaporation increases. One of our scientists, Paul Rober, looked at the hydrologic budget for, this is for Lake Michigan and Huron, which hydrologically are one, one lake and looked at the terms in a water balance and pulled out the, the input term from the evaporation term and looked just at the evaporation. 
And what he showed was that evaporation over the last 30 years or so has increased by about 25%. If rainfall had not increased, if you just think of the evaporation term alone, it would have decreased lake levels by maybe as eight or 10 feet. That's an enormous drop in lake levels. But because uh, water level, because it's been also been wetter, much of that evaporative loss has been offset by increasing uh, lake levels, <coughs> by, by increasing precipitation. This is uh, a history of the Lake Michigan Huron going back to uh, the late 1990s. And you can see starting here in about um, 1999 or so, uh, this is the average no, rate. You can see the lake levels. This is the annual cycle. It's usually lowest in um, February and peaks in, in mid midsummer and goes down. You can see it up and down every year. This was the longest period on record, about 15 years, in which we'd had below average lake levels. This is also a very warm period. Now, we all know that in, two th and actually we hit an all-time low in 2013. This was a new record low in Lake Michigan. Everybody was worried about low lake levels. And then we had some very cold winters. Remember the polar vortex and, and some wet climate, and the lake levels bounce back faster probably than they've ever bounced back. And today we're, we're above the long-term average by six or eight, six or seven inches or so, okay? Now this could, uh, um, <clears throat> this could easily go back down again. I mean, the all-time high was in 86, 87, which is right over here some t someplace. Um, we're nowhere near that. Normally the lakes fluctuate on the order of about six feet. And one of the projections Paul has in terms of climate change because we're getting both more intense, and we're getting higher precipitation, more evaporation. One of the things that the modelers are predicting is that in general, lake levels will probably drop somewhat. But even if they don't, if they say, we'll get higher highs and lower lows. So we sort of have the worst of both worlds. We're gonna have to plan, if you're a coastal community like Sheboygan, you need to plan for higher highs, record highs and also record lows. Uh, and that's a challenge for flooding and shoreline erosion. Um, a lot of issues involved in that. These are some of the long-term projections uh, going out uh, toward the end of the century. And you can see these projections are kind of all over the map. But in general, most of them uh, call for lower lake levels. And you can see by not just a little amount. I mean, a, a one-foot change in lake levels is dramatic in this system. <clears throat> All right, I gotta finish up here. Uh, and the other thing about Lake uh, is precipitation is it's predicted to come in, in fewer but more intense rain events. That's one of the driving forces of what washes off our land because it's, it's, it's probably 70 to 80% of what comes off the landscape comes in like 10 events. The 10 times a year it rains hard. And as those events increase, the potential for erosion and, and uh, runoff increases as well. So, the major challenge is closing in 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> He's right on time. So, the major challenge of the 21st century, uh, someone said, is to reconcile the inherent conflict between human activity and environmental sustainability. And frankly, nowhere I think is that challenge greater than when it comes to freshwater and freshwater resources. Uh, it's a major challenge and an opportunity for us. Um, <clears throat> oh, and one other big problem. Um, uh, this is um, a few years ago uh, in Milwaukee, uh, they raised water rates, you know, and there were, you know, out, people were outraged. They were, you know, my rates went up by 20%, seven, you know, 30% in some cases. And they were writing letters to the editor and complaining about this. And finally, I, I got upset and I said, well, time out. This is not a water bill. This is not a water rate. Because the water is coming to you absolutely free. You don't pay a thin dime for it. What you pay for is the withdrawal, the distribution, the treatment, and the re-putting it back in the lake. The water, you don't pay a, th a thin dime for. <coughs> now, the, the, uh, the cost or the value of the water at the end of the pipe that you and I use, all right, or the farmer or the brewery or whoever it might be, use it. That we could probably put a value to. We could, you know, it might be difficult, but we could estimate, I think, fairly accurately what the economic value to us as individuals and businesses, et cetera, and communities, what that value is. The value of the water at the other end of the pipe, the end of the pipe that's out in Lake Michigan, the value to the system. Now, that would be 
a lot harder, a lot harder to calculate, to estimate. But I can guarantee you one thing, it is not zero. It's not zero. And the problem is, we're not paying it. We're not paying, uh, we're having the lake is subsidizing our activities and that cannot, that cannot go on in my view. And so, of course I wrote a, <coughs> A uh, couple op-ed pieces about this. This happens to be my particular soapbox issue. If you ask people, what should we do to improve water quality, make the lakes fishable and swimmable? 97% of the people will say, do whatever it takes. I said, you serious? Do whatever it takes. So I said, okay, here's one solution. I suggested we put a surcharge on water use, two cents per 100 gallons. Now the average household uses about 100 gallons a day, so it's two cents a day. Most people can't tell you what their water bill is because it's so low they don't pay that much attention to it. This would add about a dollar a month to the average household, $12 a year. We pay more for that than we do a cup of coffee during the week or certainly cell phone service or any of the other things we use. Um, <clears throat> in Milwaukee, that would generate between four and five million dollars a year. Now, that's not a lot of money. But over time, if we invest that in understanding what we're doing in the environment, it can have an impact. Across the entire basin, it would be on the order of $200 million a year. It would go a long way towards understanding what we're doing because, frankly, the Great Lakes are a managed ecosystem. Whether we like it or not, whether we do it deliberately or inadvertently, we manage the system, and you cannot manage something unless you understand how it works. And that's, r that's truly important. And we don't, are not investing enough in understanding that, that lake. Uh, one of the things, of course, uh, I'm a big proponent of is the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, this proposed, this, pro this uh, particular program was, was taken out of the federal budget at least initially, but it's been put in back by Congress. Um, uh, it was originally uh, uh, proposed at around uh, four million, $400 million a year, uh, a $2, million a $2 billion program. Um, it's currently funded at about $300 million a year. That's simply a down payment, not even a down payment on what's needed in this system. Um, we need to take this program from, initiative, from, from an initiative to a program. I also think that we should establish a target date by which we say we are going to restore the Great Lakes by you name the date. We can argue what that date should be, but we should say, no, we are going to restore the lakes by 2040. That is two things in my mind. One, it gives us some urgency that we have to do it, okay? It's on us. And it also indicates the, the level of investment needed. Because it's not, it's not trivial, but we are definitely capable of doing it. There's no question in my mind we have the economic potential. And the benefit economically to the region is immense. Economists have estimated for a $20 billion investment in Great Lakes restoration, we return conservatively return 50 to $80 billion return of value to the system. So it makes economic sense. <coughs> uh, we are at the School of Freshwater Sciences. Um, uh, the, with the Great Lakes Water Institute and the Center for Great Lakes Studies, have been, we celebrated our 50th year last year. Um, however, the school is relatively new. It was formed in 2009. We transitioned from a, solely from a research institute to a graduate program in freshwater science. We're the only one in the country. We currently have about 65 graduate students in the program, and we're very proud of that. Uh, we have a new building, a $53 million addition to our facility, and we're very proud of that as well. Our number one priority in the school and the science we conduct is to understand the ecosystem. As I said, you can't manage something and take care of it unless you understand how it works. <clears throat> we also have a Center for Water Policy um, because policy is what drives everything that we do. In other words, uh, we have the will of people to understand the, the programs and the mechanisms by which we will correct the ills and protect the lakes. Um, someone said the future has no constituency. Which is true. I mean, my great great grandchildren can't come to me and say, Val, why didn't you, you know, take care of this? Why did you, you know, put this off on us? So it really is our responsibility, I think, to understand what's going on and to protect these lakes for future generations. Because they're going to be around 100 years from now, 200 years from now, 500 years from now. Okay. One of the things uh, 
Uh, here's a here's a here's a crass plug. We uh, uh, we have a research vessel, the RV Niske, which is a Native American word which means clean, pure water. Niske is a great boat, but she's 63 years old and uh, has pretty much reached the le <laughs> reached the end of her lifetime. And so we're in the process of of raising funds for a new state-of-the-art research vessel for the Great Lakes. Uh, we want to raise 20 million dollars. If anybody's got, you know, an extra 10 million bucks, don't leave the room without talking to me. <laughs> this thing okay final thought uh, the Great Lakes are essentially closed systems the water residence time for Lake Michigan is about a hundred years so that means for all intents and purposes anything you throw toss leak or otherwise like get into the system I always tell people if you put it in today there's a good chance you will drink it tomorrow and if not tomorrow sometime in you know the not too distant future so uh, you also know that water makes up a significant portion of your body, 70% of your brain, 80% of your blood. So if you're like me and you've lived in this area and you drink Milwaukee tap water or Sheboygan tap water, you are more, think about that, you are more Lake Michigan than you are anything else. Yeah, so what's it going to be, you know? And those are two untouched photographs of the, of the Great Lakes. So thank you. <laughs> and and one, one, uh, one favor, if I don't, I'm not a Facebook person, but if you are a Facebook, please go on our Facebook page and like us. You'll make me a hero back at the lab with my younger colleagues who, you know, Val, always mention our Facebook page. Would you please, you know? So there you go. So I'd be happy to take any questions. We have, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes. Jane, I don't know. Yes, in the back. Hi. Uh, is this on? Okay. I can't tell from here. Um, so I have a comment slash, uh, I don't know. I'm going to say it anyway. So I, you had a slide that had said science to policy to law. And I think that's really interesting. But I think we also need to look at how um, the science also maybe inspires change in business practices, whether it's from Polar Company, which is the place where I work. Um, uh, to even smaller businesses within our community. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So rather than forcing companies to change because of the law, how can we inspire them by this information and the op economic opportunity that they have to make these changes? Yeah. So, so a lot of, um, we all use water, whether it's directly, like if you're making beer or, um, or processing food, or whether you're in a manufacturing process. I mean, um, and there's a huge incentive for companies to conserve water. For example, uh, Miller Brewing. In order to make a can of beer, they have to heat water, cool water, reheat it, recool it, and then they finally put it in a can. Heating and cooling that water takes a lot of energy. So the less water they use, the less heating and cooling they do, the more money they save. Ford Motor Company, for example, um, has changed the way they paint their vehicles. They used to use a lacquer-based, solvent-based paint. They now use a water-based paint. They recycle the water. They have now plants, uh, and their newer plants have zero water use, and it saves them money. So we all have, the, you know, I think the technology for conserving water, uh, even in an area like Wisconsin, where you'd say, wow, we live on 20% of the world's fresh water. What are we worried about? Well, talk to the people in Waukesha or Madison or wherever else. I mean, there are places not too far away where water conservation is a big issue. So it, that's a very good point. Yes, ma'am. So there's a lot of, yeah, there's a, the, the question is what's the, for restoration, you know, what kinds of activities that, uh, are being done? A lot of things. Restoration of, of coastal wetlands, for example. Um, cleaning up uh, con formerly contaminated harbors like here in Sheboygan or in uh, Green Bay, for example. Um, there are some 43 areas of concern around the Great Lakes that were contaminated to the extent that they adversely impacted human or wildlife health. Uh, we've managed, managed to clean up a couple of those. So there's a ma major cleanup. And we have the ability, I mean, we're gonna spend, when the dust clears in Green Bay, 
Uh, I think the last number I saw, we're going to spend $1.2 billion to clean PCBs out of the Fox River. Yeah, I mean, a more normal ecosystem, that's an excellent point. What is a more normal ecosystem? I think uh, any ecologist who tells you what Lake Michigan or the Great Lakes are going to look like 15 years from now, forget it. We don't know. I mean, the system is not at steady state. Look at the impact of these dry sanded mussels have had on the system uh, and the sort of ripple effects that they've had on the system. Very difficult to tell. I mean, my feeling is we've been sort of on the back of the train looking out the back and sort of seeing what has happened. And what we really need to do is get out in front and understand how the ecosystem works. Because once you have the data to understand how the system works, you can put together a model of how it's going to react in the future. And that's the only way that we're going to sort of get out in front of these issues. If we have a well-calibrated, well-informed model, and, but no models are perfect, obviously. But once we have those models, we can sort of come in a projection of what the future will, will look like and, and make some corrections in that. Middle. At least, you know, be conservative. Yes? Well, I've been working within the Great Lakes for, as an engineer, I have to go. Um, for over 40 years and now the two-minute warning part of my uh, one of the biggest challenges I have is the departure from the norm when you display you know changes in Great Lakes water surface elevations over the last 15 or 20 years then you look at say for the past 50 years and looking forward we know that the departures are accelerating that these departures are getting bigger and bigger both positive and negative so I'm a big modeler. I have always been a big modeler. But I really have, I'm challenged by how, having to look forward, recognizing that we have a very small record of these departures. Yeah. That's, that's one issue. The second, I guess, is that um, maybe in terms of restoration, we need to provide a lot more attention at the residential level, the flush, or the numbers of flushes that we have in our homes, because a lot of the man-made pollutants that end up in the lake, the plastics, beads, pharmaceuticals, that's where they're coming from. So if we're going to make changes, there are community and cultural changes that we can make that are really easy. We just have to present a mechanism that will change minds. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you for that. One of the projects we have in, in Milwaukee is looking at some of these sort of emerging contaminants, pharmaceuticals in river water, but we're also measuring some things that are, you know, are benign. We're measuring things like cinnamon and vanilla. In other parts of the country, they've shown that three days after Thanksgiving, there'll be a big spike in vanilla and cinnamon in the water. People get that. They go, oh, well, I know where that's coming from. We all have an impact on the system. And so part of it is, you know, just people will be becoming aware of it. And I think once they are aware of it, they will they'll be like you. They said, no, we got to do something about this. This is unacceptable. So my question is, um, the fishery before in the 1990s, Lake Michigan was an unnatural fishery habitat. It wasn't natural, correct? When? I'm the, sorry. In the 1990s, Lake Michigan itself was right. not a natural fishery. No. It was man-made. So I agree that the data before, that we have not really seen the data from like 1920 onward, and that would be very interesting to see what that data looks like. Um, I guess, too, what I wanted to say was that in order to actually fulfill a restoration project, you have to close off the St. Lawrence Seaway and only do intra-water transportation and then you have to get rid of the invasive species. Is there a plan on how to get rid of <coughs> mussels? No. Uh, dry sand and mussels are here to stay. Uh, the system has changed for all time, you know, and so the only question is, is you know, to stop the next invader uh, could have some impact. And we don't know. I mean, it, it, it looks as if the quagga mussels have expanded now to, they sort of topped out. It looks like the population has reached a peak. Anytime you have a monoculture of anything, you are susceptible to a sudden crash. Uh, and that could dramatically change. So we don't really know. 
Um, there are very good fisheries records in the Great Lakes going back a long time. Um, the history of fisheries in the Great Lakes is the history of introduced species, whether they got in inadvertently or whether they put in deliberately. And when they opened the seaway, one of the first things that came in was the lamprey eel. And it basically wiped out lake trout, for example, in, in Lake Michigan. In the late 50s, the DNR said six million linear feet of gillnet, and they caught six fish. Basically wiped them out. And we've spent millions of dollars restocking lake trout in, in the Great Lakes without any effect. One of the other feast spe um, species that came in, of course, was the alewife, which back in the 50s and 60s, some of you probably remember, was hugely abundant, would have, was susceptible to die off, would pile up on the beaches, it was horrible. They'd use front end loaders to get rid of these damn fish. And a guy by the name of, um, of Tanner, who was the uh, secretary of the DNR um, in Michigan, hit upon the idea of stocking salmon in the Great Lakes, uh, Pacific salmon, to feed on alewives to reduce the alewife population. That was phenomenally successful. The alewife population went down is what you might expect. I mean, they created a world-class salmon fishery in the Great Lakes. I mean, they were catching huge fish. People would literally come from all over the world to fish Lake Michigan. And what you would expect happened, happened is that the alewife population went down, but also then the salmon started to go down too, to the point where, believe it or not, some fishing groups were advocating stocking alewives. Um, <laughs> But the DNRs of those states would get together every year and decide because uh, Atlantic Sand or Pacific Sand, Coho and Chinook, you know, they swim upstream and die when they reproduce. We decide every year on how many fish to stock in this system. Well, after the Clean Water Act and our water quality improved in our in the streams, uh, particularly in Michigan, um, salmon started to naturally reproduce in some of those streams, and so there was natural reproduction. It's now estimated in Lake Huron and Lake Michigan that much as 60 to 70 percent of the salmon in the lake are naturally reproduced. So the management tool has gone, basically. Mother Nature has taken over control. The other population has taken a huge nosedive, and one interesting thing is that is lake trout have started to reproduce successfully again in the lakes. And the theory is that because the alewife population has dropped so much, and that was the main forage base for, for lake trout, they have switched to other species. Alewife can tame a very high concentration of an enzyme, a thymidase, which apparently interferes with lake trout reproduction. And when they shifted their diet off of alewives and other feeds, all of a sudden they were starting to, re and we're starting to see now, natural reproduction of lake trout in the Great Lakes. Yes? So Asian carp, you know, gets in the news a lot. It's in, the, it, for those of you who don't know, it's in, this, it's in the Mississippi drainage, the Illinois River, uh, the Chicago drainage canal, the, the flow was reversed, so that's a connection to the Great Lakes. There is an electrical barrier put on the Chicago drainage canal. Uh, we originally was put in to keep round gobies from getting into the Mississippi drainage. That door was originally decided to slam the other way keep gobies from getting out of the Great Lakes. Now they beefed that up in order to keep um, Asian carp out. Uh, the problem is, of course, that you know the engineer has not yet been born and can design a system that never fails. And with fish, or with biology, it only takes one gravid female and then you know, you're off and running. Of course, in, they're always described in the press as the voracious Asian carp that eats 40% of its body weight a day. Now, with water clarity this high in Lake Michigan, you would have to swim a long way to get 40% of your body weight because these are planktivorous fish. They do not eat other fish. Um, <clears throat> Most of the fish ecologists that I know say that Asian carp would have a very difficult time making a living in Lake Michigan. Now, that doesn't mean they couldn't make a living in other parts of the lake. Western end of Lake Erie, which is a very eutrophic system, southern end of Green Bay. They're used to living in, in larger, they're riverine fish. They're used to living in large rivers. They need about 60 kilometers of flowing water in order to spawn in, and we just don't have rivers like that in the Great Lakes. The Chicago Drainage Canal is not the only door. Uh, the Maumee River, or the Wabash River in Indiana, when it floods in the spring, actually will connect to the Maumee River, and there are Asian carp in that system, so they could jump the divide there. My daughter is uh, an assistant U.S. attorney. She was in the Cleveland office. They had a case there, this wasn't her case, but they had a case there where people were taking Asian carp, fishing out of the Mississippi drainage, 
putting them in water tanks and taking them to the fish market in, in Toronto, which has a very high Asian population. They like live fish. They don't want to buy a dead fish. They want a live fish. They put these fish on the ice, take them across the border. Once they got across the border, they'd fill a tank back with water. The fish would wake up. And they caught those guys. So there's more than one way for this. And, and my feeling is eventually they will, if they haven't already, and there's some evidence they have, will get into the system. The question is, how big a threat are they? Um, but if you want, I mean, the old, the, the, the idea of being conservative or, you know, is, is good. Because biology organisms are very adaptable. And although we say it was not a, a great system for them, but it's not an easy, cheap fix to close off the system.